Friday marks eight years of civil war in Syria, and today we're taking a closer look at how terror has made a lasting impact on the country. Just over the weekend, U.S.-backed Syrian forces launched an assault on what's believed to be the last Islamic State enclave in eastern Syria. Airstrikes reportedly targeted weapons storage. At its height, the Islamic State's so-called caliphate spanned over a third of both Iraq and Syria. And through the group's presence, and though the group's presence is down to a small piece of territory, military officials say ISIS remains a threat. In December of last year, President Trump made the surprise announcement that all U.S. troops would be pulled from Syria, claiming ISIS had been defeated. Though the intelligence community rebuked his assessment, it wasn't until last month Mr. Trump reversed his decision, keeping 200 troops on the ground. And Seth Jones joins me now from Washington. He's a senior advisor to the International Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Seth, welcome. Great to have you with us. There is a lot to unpack here, but I want to play what President Trump said in December regarding ISIS in Syria. Let's take a listen. We've been fighting for a long time in Syria. I've been president for almost two years, and we've really stepped it up. And we have won against ISIS. We've beaten them, and we've beaten them badly. Now, Seth, we know he's since walked back on that and recently wrote to members of Congress that he agrees 100 percent with keeping a military presence in Syria. What do you think caused this reversal? Well, it's not entirely clear what the internal deliberations were within the administration, but what we do know is that um, every single uh, government agency, especially uh, senior individuals that I spoke to across the Department of Defense, Department of State, and the U.S. intelligence community, did not support a full withdrawal of U.S. forces. They're concerned about a resurgence of ISIS. They're concerned about activity of al-Qaeda-linked groups in Syria. They're also concerned about Iranian and Russian activity. So for all of those reasons, uh, there was a strong push within senior officials in various agencies not to withdraw. So I, I think that eventually they convinced mm -hmm. uh, the president to, to back off. Now, when it comes specifically to ISIS, at the beginning of the year, the White House did claim several times that ISIS's caliphate had crumbled. What do we know about the remaining presence of ISIS in places like Syria and Iraq? And are they holding large groups of civilians, as they are wont to do, as sort of protection? Well, what ISIS has really done, and probably the best way to think about it, is it has lost its ability to have a quasi-state. It doesn't control territory anymore. Uh, it doesn't have uh, adjudication, justice dispute resolution mechanisms. Uh, what it is now is a terrorist organization. But I think it's worth understanding that even recent U.N. estimates have the size of ISIS in both Iraq and Syria is almost 20,000 on the high end. So there are a lot of ISIS fighters inside of uh, Iraq and Syria capable of conducting large amounts of violence, which they've been doing in both Syria and Iraq. What they don't do is control a lot of territory. So, as you just mentioned, since the group's territorial capability seems minimal at this point, what about its military capability? Does ISIS have a lot of military equipment left? Yeah, it does, uh, it, it, at least to conduct a guerrilla campaign. I mean, it, 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 it doesn't require a lot to be able to do that. It requires uh, the ability to build bombs, improvised explosive devices, which it has. It, it requires the ability to conduct and collect intelligence, which it has within major cities. Um, it needs to be able to pay personnel to conduct attacks and to, to pay for some of these weapons. It has all of that. What it doesn't have at the moment is a lot of weapons for uh, a major conventional uh, style assault the way it took over parts of Iraq and Syria in 2014. So it's more of a guerrilla slash terrorist organization than it is a group that's going to be able to retake territory, you know, in the, in the foreseeable future. So you say it's more of a terrorist organization. Does it no longer hold any civilians as quasi hostages? I mean, it has some civilians, uh, but not large numbers. Mm -hmm. um, the, probably the more serious issue on the holding of individuals is the large number, uh, eight to 900 or so, um, members of ISIS that the Syrian Democratic Forces and the U.S. are holding of ISIS. And there's been a big question about what to do with them, whether to give them to third-party countries, their home territory, 
or in some cases even to release them. And, and that's actually probably a more serious issue at the moment than ISIS holding civilians. Yeah, nobody knows what to do with these, uh, these former fighters. Now, do we know, we do know that the Civil War started back in 2011. Do we know if this country's ongoing instability makes it an easy target for ISIS? Yeah, I think there's no question that there are at least three factors that uh, work in ISIS's favor. One is uh, that the country is still in a state of war. Uh, even over the last few days, we've seen Assad's regime attempting to move on areas of northwestern Syria in the Idlib area. The second is there's a lot of outside support from governments, including Gulf states, to provide assistance to rebel groups inside of Syria. And then third, uh, there's, there's just, there, there's not um, a successful ability to keep control of the borders, uh, either in Syria, including up into Turkey, or with Iraq. So there's a lot of ability for fighters to move across borders and then come back when the environment becomes a little bit more conducive. Especially if these 800 are released, as uh, no one seems to know what to do with them. What is the latest uh, on, on these fighters who are prisoners now? Well, I've talked to a number of senior uh, officials from Western countries, the French, uh, the British, the Australians. Many of them do not want back uh, fighters, even ones uh, that, ha that either are or have been their own citizens. They don't want them in prisons. They don't want them to radicalize. So the U.S. has been trying to get other countries to take them. Um, in a few cases, there does appear to be evidence that some have been released, but this is a huge, huge challenge right now where the U.S. is pushing uh, a number of uh, either their home governments or third governments to take desperately to, to, to take them in and to, you know, to prosecute them at least humanely. All right, Seth Jones, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much.